Holy crap, what are you doing to me, Togashi? How can something be so climactic and yet so anticlimactic at the same time? Look, I'll admit, I was incredibly naive to get so wildly excited for the potential of seeing Nobunaga's Nen abilities. I spent far too much time zeroing in on exactly what I wanted that I missed the bigger picture. But I'm not at all disappointed because what we got was in many ways so, so much better. I love that Luini burst into the room all flashy-like, flash flash. Lots of big talk and for whatever reason with a crescent moon on his face at all times, he definitely went for dramatic. Whereas the Phantom Troop just went, uh. Sort of like a reaction to seeing a fly buzzing around your room. Because yeah, you know, the fly is mildly annoying, but can I really be bothered to actually do something about it? Ah, uh, I guess so. And then SWAT. Which is exactly what Nobunaga did. He took the mildly annoying bug that is Luini, or I should say that was Luini, and eliminated him with a strike so casual and unremarkable that it actually goes full circle and becomes incredibly hype and completely remarkable. I really like the precision of Nobunaga. Many of the troop members do have those big flashy style abilities and to be fair, Nobunaga, he might still have one as well. But it's very in keeping with his samurai theme to start and end the battle with a single strike. I love it. If this was almost any other shonen manga, I feel like the bulk of this chapter would have been dedicated to like a big showcase Nobunaga fight. Despite how irrelevant Luini is, he would be more or less a sacrificial vehicle to showcase the glory that is Nobunaga. But all Togashi needs to showcase that glory is a single prod in the head. And again, I think this really emphasizes that the troop operate in an entirely different sphere to the more down to earth style Nen users within the Kaki and Mafia families. The princes are definitely evolving to a much higher level, but the Mafia families right now are all about, you know, hand screws and pigeon cuffs. They've got a long way to go. It pretty perfectly set the tone for the conversation that Henry would have with Hisoka later in the chapter, particularly with the whole admission that, look, mate, we, we really don't want to fight you. We know that would end badly for us, not for you. Both the Jiyu and the Chara families know that they are not going to be able to bring either Hisoka or the troop down, so their whole mission is about turning the calamity that is their existence into their favor before having both calamities ideally destroy each other and preserve balance. Which to be fair to them is working out so far because the Phantom Troop have decided that they are going after the Hale Lee family. Not because of an agreement with the Chara family, not because of any kind of personal gain, but it's because the mission of the Hale Lee family offends the troop on a very primal level. You know the whole philosophy of, eh, let's destroy the word for the lulz. That's very counter to what the Phantom Troop stand for. And I know it's always a bit weird to dive into the moral compass of the Phantom Troop, but every Everything they do, no matter how horrible, always has a purpose. Even the Kurta genocide was performed for the sake of profit. It is of course despicable and abhorrent, but I suppose at least it's not murder just for the sake of kill murdering. And also, I think that unknowingly, Luini very much threatened the troop when he did his whole we're gonna destroy the world thing and revealed that they were going to head back to the human realm. Because that sort of indiscriminate destruction would obviously come to target Meteor City. So just like when the troop returned to defend the city against the Chimera Ants, they now see the Hale Lee family as a threat to Meteor your city if they are left untouched. So the Phantom Troop are gonna touch them touch them with death. That and the Phantom Troop generally don't indulge in chaos just for the sake of chaos, which is a very stark contrast to Hisoka in this very chapter, who admits that he enjoys that quite a lot. Mm, yes, chaos. But even at their very worst, the troop are all about controlled chaos. So the values of the troop are actually very much in line with the Jiyu and Chara families. Whereas the values of our battle clown Hisoka, I think are much more aligned with the Hale Lee family. Because if worst did come to worst, all Morena is going to do is turn the human realm into some sort of battle world that fosters a seemingly endless supply of powerful Nen uses for Hisoka to consume. If I was Hisoka, I feel like I would actually consider teaming up with Morena. Because that's what I, as a selfish, horny battle clown, would see is in my best interests. Especially knowing that the Hale Lee are about to be targeted by the troop, which Hisoka does know because good old honest Henry revealed all of the plans to him. Speaking of, Henry's honesty was bizarrely refreshing. Because this arc so far has been all about secrecy, plotting, and a war of information. So it was like a much needed exhale to watch these two separate parties just speaking bluntly to one another. Which way both ways because Hisoka had a very interesting question for Henry about who he thinks would win versus the troop. And Henry basically says, yeah, look, mate, I, I'm putting my money on them. Which for many antagonists might be seen as quite insulting, like the whole, oh, you underestimate my power, you, you pigeon man, pigeon man. But with Hisoka, there's another layer to this because <laughs> well, it sounds weird to say, but this is kind of like his equivalent of dirty talk. Oh, you think I'd lose? Tell me who in particular I'd lose to. 
Tell me about how strong they are and how badly they're going to beat me in as much excruciating detail as you can muster, you naughty, naughty pigeon boy. So weirdly, this is very much playing right into Hisoka's desires. Henry is, I guess, kind of acting as like a pre-battle fluffer here. And Hisoka is a patient man. You will definitely wait for a good time. So I'm not at all surprised with the idea that Hisoka may have taken up Henry on his offer. Also remember that Hisoka, for all of his down and dirty kill murdering, is a man who definitely enjoys his luxury. He has very high standards when it comes to living quarters, cleanliness, and of course, fashion. So I'm not at all surprised that an invitation to wait in a VVIP room on tier one may pretty seriously tempt him. What I'm more surprised by is that they immediately tried to put him on tier one instead of tier two. Because remember, tier one, that's where all of the princes are. That's where the succession war is currently taking place. So this whole idea is kind of the equivalent of taking Hisoka off one battlefield and just plonking him on another. And I cannot imagine that Hisoka would be able to resist getting involved if he does go to tier one. He's not going to walk into an orgy of death and just decide not to participate because there is only so much temptation a man can take before his swing takes over, which would start to make tier one a very nice nexus point for the story. Because if Hisoka is there, then he becomes a magnet to attract the phantom troop there and then everything all just comes together, exactly how Hisoka likes it. At this point, I don't know how likely it is that Hisoka makes it that far. And I'm interested in the tier one pass that Henry hands Hisoka because in theory, any person could use that and gain access to tier one. So I'm almost certainly overthinking this, but it could be more of a plot device to get handed off to someone else so that they can reach the princes. And I'm bringing Morena back into this conversation because her contagion ability specifies that killing a prince is worth 50 levels. And again, if this was any other series, and I would say that that factor, that factor alone confirms that a Haoli family member will kill a prince because otherwise why put it in there? But this is Hunter x Hunter and the series is just packed with very interesting, but not necessarily story relevant information. But the existence of this simple pass opens up a lot of doors, literally and narratively. Because without it, tier one is, just, it's like impossible to access unless you brute force your way through, which is probably not the greatest of idea, even for the Phantom Troop. But speaking of levels in Contagion and Morena, this chapter left me slightly confused with the Haley section because they spend a ton of time talking about having someone develop a counter ability for pigeons. And one of them says, yeah, we could do that, but we'll need to get to level 21 first, which confuses me because in the original explanation of Morena's heart, so it says that that upon reaching level 20 is when the ability manifests. Like it's very clear, it's not after gaining 20 levels, which would make sense if one started at level one. Like it quite matter of factly states upon reaching level 20. This is important because there are two characters here who are currently level 20s, but through their conversation appear not to have access to a Nen ability yet. So I don't really know what's happened here. It could be a continuity error. It could be a translation error. It could just be a Togashi retcon, but, but something is up. In any case, doesn't matter. It looks like 21 is the new way to go go now. And those two Haley family members are but one kill away from delicious nanny goodness. And it shows us something that could be very potentially dangerous about the Haley family, which is the idea of keeping people in reserve, purposely not having them reach a certain level in order to use them as something of a general Nen toolbox. In many ways, it's kind of like Nen being applied on an industrial scale. Whereas traditional users are more like your family business. They need to be versatile. They need to be able to tackle many problems. But the Haley family is more of a business enterprise, consistently training a executives to open up new branches and hire new employees to, um, to destroy the world. If left alone, they would almost certainly become the defining power holders in the Hunter Hunter world. Because right now, all they lack is experience. But if they can make up for that with numbers, teamwork, and purposely constructing certain abilities, then that could be pretty OP. With the specific abilities, I actually thought that this was quite short-sighted when I first read it. Like the idea that someone has to manifest a power specifically to deal with Henry's pigeons, because let's say that works, cool. The, Henry's not a problem anymore. But the issue is that you're not planning for the versatility of being able to do anything in the future. And then it just hit me, that doesn't matter. They don't need to be versatile because they have their industrial Nen production strategy. They just need to keep pumping out more and more product, AKA people and abilities. And they've got like 200,000 people to feed on on the Black Whale one, so they're not running out of fuel anytime soon. So I think, or at least I hope, that the Haley family have learned their lesson about, you know, just starting fight battles with no plan whatsoever. And I hope that the remaining 21 players are actually starting to strategize and work together, which it appears that they are. The beginnings of which we see at the end of the chapter with some nice teamwork between the Haley old man dude guy and Baconte, or Bacont, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he is the owner of the door ability that we're currently seeing in action. As far as I can tell at the moment, it transports whoever steps through the door 
doorway somewhere else. So really rich soldier man who did go through the door. He's, he's probably dead by now. Possibly even killed by one of the level 20 so that they can bring one of their abilities into existence. But Henry and Wang were not having any of that crap. Just briefly though, speaking of Wang, he made a face that I never ever ever want to see again in, in anything ever because that smile is utterly demonic. If I saw that in the real world, I too would be concerned for my imminent demise. And the whole everyone you smile at dies does actually seem to be a good predictor because the soldier that Wang smiled at was the same one who disappeared and is probably dead. It's a very interesting ability though, the doorway, not the Wang, although maybe Wang's smile is an ability. It's a good way to save money. But with the doorway ability, surely it probably has some very stupidly simple workaround. Like, great, we can't step through the doorway, but what if we make a hole in the wall next to it? When it comes down to things though, I'm not entirely sure what Henry and Wang's plan is here. Because even if they get around the doorman, they're walking into a den of Nen users with not only unknown abilities, but an unknown number of abilities. It really doesn't seem like the clever and experienced course of action to take. So I'm wondering if Wang has some sort of insurance ability that gives these two the sheer balls they would need to start a fight with for all they know, like two dozen Nen users at once. Well, maybe it's more about identifying, cornering, and then calling in your extended extermination force, including the Phantom Troop. What I'm starting to get more excited for is to see what the other troop cohorts are up to. Because yeah, Nobunaga's group did agree to hunt down the Haley family, but there are like four other pods just roaming around doing their own thing. And given how quickly things are moving, this batch of chapters might stand a very good chance of wrapping up the whole mafia story and then potentially move back to the main event with the princes. Either way, I am stupidly excited, so give me more, please.